Rahman Rahim. Good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure and honor to be here in the Department of Cardiology, uh, Alexandria University. And I would like to thank Professor Muhammad Ayman Abdel Hayy for the kind invitation uh, to deliver this workshop on lung ultrasound in acute cardiac care. I would like to start by uh, mentioning that I have no disclosure. And the overview of the talk uh, will uh, start by giving you an idea about the uh, principles of uh, ultrasound in general, which I'm sure that all of you are aware of this. And then we will talk about what are the normal findings that we expect to see uh, when we scan the lung. What are the advantages of lung ultrasound? What are the requirements for doing lung ultrasound study in acute cardiovascular care? And is there any evidence behind the use of lung ultrasound in the literature? And we will also talk at the end about some take home messages. And in the next part of the talk, we will give you some case-based uh, discussions on the most important pathologies that you can diagnose and uh, see with lung ultrasound. So very, very brief historical uh, introduction. Ironically, in the 1990s, in a very, very famous and popular textbook of internal medicine, Dr. Harrison said that lung is a major hindrance to air. So he concluded at that time that lung ultrasound is not a useful thing to do. And at the same time, in other parts of the world, in France, Dr. Daniel Lichtenstein proved this to be wrong by starting to scan the lung and looking for the different artifacts. And he analyzed these artifacts and gave us a new world of pathologies that can be diagnosed and analyzed by lung ultrasound. And if we look into PubMed, we can see the growing number of publications on lung ultrasound in acute cardiovascular care, especially in the field of acute heart failure. So the principles of ultrasound, as you know, ultrasound is not transmitted through aerated tissue. Air is the enemy of ultrasound, as we know that. But we will also look into the analysis of the artifacts produced by the lung, especially when pathologies arise. The normal parenchyma is normally not visible when we scan the lung with ultrasound. And the interface between the pleura and the lung, due to the different acoustic impedance, reflect the ultrasound wave. And the important thing is to put in your mind that you are looking into the intercostal space with your ultrasound probe. Of course, there are many advantages for ultrasound in general. The advantages of ultrasound, whether of the lung or the heart, it is very safe, it is reproducible, it is easy to do at the bedside, and it provides a rapid goal-directed tool for application in the acute setting. And of course, it can reduce the cost. And many studies lately try to compare the accuracy of lung ultrasound as compared to X-ray or even CT scan. So what are the different types of probes and what are the requirements that we need to have to do lung ultrasound? So it depends on what you are looking at. If you're first looking into the parenchyma, we start with the cardiac probe, the phased array transducer. It's a small probe, small footprint, fits easily in the intercostal spaces, and it gives you an image of the parenchyma of the lung, especially when pathology started to show up like consolidation, like pleural effusion, like catalexis. And if we want to look at the pleura, which is a very small superficial structure, we need to change the probe to the linear probe, the high frequency transducer. As we know, it has a high resolution, but poor penetration. So we utilize the high resolution of this probe in looking at the pleura, and we will see first the normal pleura, and then we can diagnose any abnormalities in the pleura by using the linear probe. And the importance of that, as we will see, will be in diagnosing pneumothorax, differentiating pneumonia from heart failure by looking for any abnormal pathologies and irregularities across the pleural line. Some people even use the curvilinear transducer, the abdominal transducer, instead of the cardiac probe. But I advocate using the cardiac probe because it probably gives a bit of better resolution because of phased array uh, technology. And also, it's important to consider lung ultrasound as an extension of your cardiac exam. So I advocate using the echo probe and the plural, the linear uh, high frequency probe. So when we look into the lungs and we want to divide each lung into zones to provide a systematic approach, which is also important to put in your consideration when you start to study, 
we need to divide each lung into four zones. Some schools recommend doing six zones, but for simplicity, in our workshop, we'll utilize four zones on the right side and four zones on the left. As you can see here, the nipple line is the horizontal imaginary line. And then we have the anterior border of this vertical imaginary line, which is the parasternal line. We have the middle border, which is the anterior axillary line. And we have the posterior border, which is the posterior axillary line. This will give you four zones on the right and four zones on the left lung. You have right medial upper, right lateral upper, right medial lower, and right lateral lower. And the same goes on the left side. So where is the location of the probe? You, now you have the probe in your hand. You know what type of probe you are using in the beginning, and you know the location of the probe. So how to put the probe and which area of the lung you will scan first. When you are looking for pneumothorax, for example, because air goes up, we look at the non-dependent areas of the lung. And the transducer is recommended to be initially vertically with the indicator of the probe towards the patient head. This will give you what it is called as bad sign, as we will see it shortly. And then you will rotate the probe horizontally so you can align your beam with the intercostal space and avoiding any rib shadow and look for the pleura itself, as we will see it shortly. But if we, we are looking into pleural effusion, B lines, especially in heart failure, we start to look basally. And if we are looking into pleural effusion specifically, we have to put into our anatomical structure the costophrenic angle, because the diaphragm will be our landmark. Whether you are looking on the right side with the liver, or you looking on the left side with the spleen. And now we know the probe location, the probe type, and the orientation. Let's go for the normal semiotics of the different lung ultrasound artifacts. This is what is described by Dr. Leitenstein as the bad sign. And the bad sign is simply when you put your linear probe, the high frequency probe, at the second intercostal space, mid clavicular line, with the indicator to the patient's head, you are transecting with the beam two ribs. And then you will have here, as you can see on the screen, two rib shadows, this black and this black line here. And in the middle, you have this shimmering hyperechoic line, which is the pleural line. It's very important to see this shimmering hyperechoic line. It is a reflection of the pleural line, and you can look closely and see the sliding of both layers of the pleura together the visceral and parietal pleura. This sliding is very important to rule out pneumothorax. So once you have air between the visceral and parietal pleura, the air will not be transmitted and you will not be able to see the sliding here. And the image on the right side shows you a mirror-shaped artifact of this pleural line at equal distance from the pleural line. This is what they call as A lines and A stands for aeration. So in you, when you look at the lungs with, the, with your linear probe or even your cardiac probe and see these A lines, you can tell that there is no extravascular lung water. So these A lines are important to diagnose or rule out a heart failure or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, for example. So remember the pleural line is your landmark. And when we look carefully and closely at the sliding, it's better to avoid the rib shadow now and rotate your probe so you align your beam with the intercostal space. And now you can see the sliding very clearly here between the visceral and parietal pleura. And to have this sliding, it's very important that you have your patient with adequate breathing and ventilation. So for example, patients on VV ECMO, respiratory ECMO, who are not ventilated, you will not be able to see the sliding. Because for the sliding to happen, you need to have adequate ventilation to have the proper sliding of both layers. And also you should have a, a lung without, a pleura without extensive fibrosis or adhesions. So this sliding can be lost if there is extensive pleural fibrosis or adhesions. And to confirm that there is sliding, you can put your M mode cursor, and this gives you the very characteristic waves on a sandy beach or seashore sign, as we can see here. So you have what they describe as the seashore. Initially, you have the waves, which reflect the analysis of the chest wall. And then you have 
the plural line, the very hyperechoic line, which is described as the breaker. And then you have this very important sandy-like heterogeneous structure of the lung parenchyma, which is the most important part of this figure. Because once you have air between the both layers of the pleura, you will lose this heterogeneity and the sandy-like appearance. So this is what they call as waves on a sandy beach. And this rules out pneumothorax. We just mentioned the A-lines, and this is another uh, example of the A-lines. We use the cardiac probe to get this. And when we examine each sector, when we find this, we can tell that there is no pulmonary congestion or there is no extravascular lung water. Because we remember that extravascular lung water can happen due to hydrostatic pulmonary edema and heart failure, or it can happen in non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema like ARDS patients. So this can tell you that there is no extravascular lung water. And as we mentioned early, very important for them to be at equal distance from each other. And they are just mirror-shaped artifacts from the physics terms. And very important sign as well, which rules out pneumothorax, is described as the lung pulse. So when we look by 2D at the lung, this is an example. We utilized the cardiac probe, the phased IV transducer, in this clip on the right. And we look at the right side, the right costophrenic angle. We can see here the, the, the liver, the diaphragm, and there is another liver on the other side of the diaphragm, which is actually a consolidated lung, which is quite hepatized, very heterogeneous. Normally, you don't see anything here. It should be black if it's only air. Once it is transformed into tissue or consolidation, you will start to see this very dense hyperechoic shadow. And if you look with every heartbeat, you will see the lung has transmitted pulsations from the heart. This is described as lung pulse. And when you put an M-mode cursor on it, with your ECG-gated study, you will see these intermittent synchronized oscillations of the lung tissue with every heartbeat. This is described as lung pulse. And again, this is one of the things that rules out pneumothorax. We just said about lung sliding, and we said that lung sliding will be absent in pneumothorax, will be absent if there is a pleural fibrosis or adhesion, but there are other causes of loss of lung sliding. Like, for example, if your patient has right main stem intubation, so you will not find lung sliding on the left lung because it will not be ventilated. And if your patient has massive atelectasis, for example, see, so that the, the, the silver line is adequate tidal volume and adequate ventilation to see the lung sliding. And if you lose the, the, the visualization behind the pleural line in pneumothorax, if you want to confirm that by M mode, you will have this very characteristic barcode sign as compared to the seashore sign, the beautiful waves on sandy beach. And we're having the summer now with the time coming for remembering the sea and the beach. So when we look on the left side, you can see a mirror shaped reflection of the chest wall across the far field, which is exactly what you see in pneumothorax. You are losing the heterogeneity and the sandy like structure of the lung tissue. This is a typical finding in pneumothorax, which is called stratosphere sign or barcode sign. And this is one of the studies that showed different signs putting together to diagnose patients with pneumothorax. If you have A-lines, because A-lines can be found in pneumothorax as well, um, and you have absence of B-lines, so in pneumothorax, you will not see B-lines, because anything behind the pleura would not be seen. And also in pneumothorax, you will lose the sliding you will lose the lung pulse, and you will characteristically find something important, which is called the lung point. So this is the transition between area with sliding and area without sliding. You can see it by M mode, like here, where you suddenly lose the heterogeneity when you move from the area with normal lung, the normal aeration, to the area with pneumothorax. And you will see it here by looking at your 2D sector, and this area has a sliding, and the very right area lost the sliding. This is important when you follow up your, the progression of pneumothorax. So the, the more lateral the lung point, the smaller the pneumothorax. The more medial the lung point, the bigger pneumothorax. Let's go to our important part in acute heart failure or acute cardiac care, which is the B lines. How we can see B lines and how can we analyze B lines? So the B lines are different from the curly B lines that we used to see in X-ray, although both happen in patients with heart failure. 
The bee lines are vertical comet tails, vertical laser-like comet tails that arise from the plural line and actually extend down to the far field of the sector. It's opposite to the A lines. So they are vertical, they are moving with the lung sliding, and the number of B lines reflect the degree of extravascular lung water, which is a very important thing to consider when you are diagnosing, when you are following up, and when you are assessing the response to treatment and the prognosis of your heart failure patients. So the important thing about them, as we said, the B lines, the more number of B lines, the more likelihood of hiding the A lines behind them because you are losing the aeration. And as we said also, we move with the lung sliding. And these are two different examples of patients with increased extravascular lung water. If you ask me, are the patients with heart failure or, or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema? I will tell you, I don't know. From this only clip, I cannot tell. I need to look at the pleura, as I will show you shortly, and tell whether this is a pure hydrostatic pulmonary edema, because they will have a thin pleura, or this is a, pneum a pneumonia, an ARDS, with increased extravascular lung water. So these are the examples. And when we look carefully, we'll see that the more the number of B lines, they become like a curtain, so they become confluent. And there is important, uh, uh, this is an example of the curtain-like B lines, because they actually reflect even alveolar edema, which is the highest degree of hydrostatic edema, or increase in the extravascular lung water. And these are the fields where you can use your B lines in heart failure, monitoring therapy, risk stratification, monitoring your patients on dialysis and volume overload, and of course, ARDS and interstitial lung disease. This is a very important, very important spectrum of progress of the interstitial syndrome, where you have the lowest degree of interstitial edema with black normal aeration, and with the increasing number of B lines, you are losing the aeration, and you are seeing increasing number of B lines, and this also can be applied in patients with non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, where they end up with consolidation at the end, as we will see shortly. And this is different uh, degrees of interstitial edema based on the counting the number of B lines or seeing the extent of B lines. From no B lines here, which is t telling that the lungs is aerated, with one B line, which actually tells nothing, because normally we should have less than three B lines in one sector. So if you have more than three B lines in one sector of the sectors that we mentioned early, then you will start to think of a pathology. And then you will have a full white screen, which is uh, roughly estimated to, to have uh, about 10 uh, B lines. Different studies uh, correlated the number of B lines to uh, the, patho the prognosis of patients with heart failure. And this is an important study, which was quite recently published in the JAC. And they studied 97 patients, and they compared lung ultrasound with the previously validated clinical congestion score, which includes the NT pro BMP, E over E prime, and the chest X-ray and the six minutes walk test. And they actually find that the B lines were significantly correlated with more established parameters of decompensation, and they found a cutoff of 15 or more of B lines is considered as a quick and reliable assessment of decompensation in outpatients with heart failure. And this is a nice algorithm which can guide you into the utilization of B lines for assessment and uh, risk stratification of patients with chronic systolic heart failure, where you can adjust your therapy based on that. And also this is another study which was published in the European Heart Journal, and it utilized the B lines uh, as a tool for detection and prognostication of the pulmonary congestion uh, in patients who are ambulatory heart failure patients. So now we come to the very important, I call it one million pound question. How to differentiate cardiogenic pulmonary edema from non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema by lung ultrasound? It's a, one of the important dilemmas that we face in acute cardiac care. Is it possible to differentiate? Yes, it is possible. How? So when we look with the linear probe, the vascular probe, we will need to look carefully at the pleural line. And in isolated heart failure patients, they have a thin pleura. So the pleural line will be healthy. You will see the sliding. 
It will not be irregular. And if your patient has a pneumonia, and of course ARDS as a consequence, you will see a different picture of the pleural line. It will be irregular as this one. You will see what they called as subpleural consolidation, which are hypoechoic shadows underneath the pleural line. And the pleural line will end up being shaggy and irregular and unhealthy. And when you see it, you will never miss it. This is very important. And also in patients with pneumonia and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, they usually have spared areas in the lungs. So they have isolated areas of B lines and unhealthy pleura. And in between, you have normal spared areas. But in heart failure patients, the picture is different because you will have bilateral B lines which are more in number and more extensive at the basis by gravity. And if they don't have pneumonia with the heart failure, you will see a very healthy pleural line, as we will see in one of our patients in the hands-on. And this is a characteristic example of the differences between hydrostatic pulmonary edema and B lines on the right side with very thin and healthy pleura here. And this is a patient with B lines and this irregular and shaggy pleural line. And you can see here clearly the hypoechoic shadow under the pleura, which is very specific for, pneum for pneumonia. It's called subpleural consolidation. And of course, in ARDS and pneumonia, we will see consolidation sometimes, which is also characteristic for non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, while in heart failure and hydrostatic edema, we will see pleural effusion mainly on the right side and without consolidation. So this is another key for differentiation. And this is how we see the consolidation. We look at the costophrenic angle, as we mentioned. We will see the diaphragm as our landmark. On the right side, you will see the liver and the diaphragm. And above the liver, you will start to see this hyperechoic heterogeneous structure, which is tissue-like. And inside that, you will see air bronchograms. These air bronchograms are very important for consolidation and also specific to diagnose pneumonia, which progresses to ARDS in patients. And this is another example of consolidation. You will never tell this with x-ray. If you put an x-ray and do an x-ray in such patient, you will just see opacity. You will never tell it's consolidation, atelectasis, or pleural effusion. And this is the value of lung ultrasound. Pleural effusion, it was the basis of performing lung ultrasound many years ago, seeing this black shadow. And the bigger the amount of pleural effusion, the more likelihood you will see compressive atelectasis at the basal parts of the lung. And you can even try to differentiate between atelectasis and consolidation by looking at the characteristics of the density of the tissue you are seeing. In atelectasis, you're more likely seeing a homogeneous structure of the lung tissue, while in consolidation, it will be heterogeneous, and you will see dynamic air bronchogram, as we will see shortly. And this is even a bigger example of compressive atelectasis and what they described as the jellyfish sign. And of course, we need to do something about this effusion to stick a drain, which you can also use by uh, perform by utilizing lung ultrasound. This is an important table to differentiate different types of interstitial syndrome by lung ultrasound, and of course, by the echo parameters as well. And remember, we mentioned lung ultrasound should be put as part of our echo study, as we recommend. So you can differentiate acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema from chronic heart failure, from acute lung injury, ARDS, and pulmonary fibrosis by lung ultrasound, by looking at the different parameters that we mentioned earlier, the pleural line, the symmetry of the distribution of the B lines, and the extensive number of B lines. Even lung ultrasound was introduced in different types of protocols in emergencies, and this is one of the famous protocols which utilized the use of ultrasound to diagnose different types of, um, of, of emergency acute problems like pneumothorax, like cardiogenic shock, like uh, septic shock. And you can tell each side of shock by looking at the B lines in correlation with the, uh, the sliding and the A lines and different lung ultrasound findings. And the important question as well that sometime we face is, we always want to ask yourself when we need to give fluids. But the other important question is when we need to stop giving fluids, which is not less important. And here comes the value of ultrasound. 
And this protocol tells you that you can limit your fluid management and fluid administration by putting your ultrasound, lung ultrasound and looking at the B lines to look for any increase in the number of B lines when you are giving fluid, which reflects evolving interstitial edema, which is a very important utilization and tool as well. So we recommend an integrated approach in your patients. We have many tools to use, which is very useful. We don't recommend using one tool in isolation. So when you have your patient with acute heart failure, look at the neck veins, look at the IVC, look at the heart, look at the pleural line, and put this all together, and you will likely get a more accurate diagnosis. And this is an example, patient with hypovolemia, you will likely see hyperdynamic heart, you will likely see collapsed IVC, and you will likely see A lines, you will not see B lines, because they are dry. And this is an example of patient with tension pneumothorax, you will likely see pressure in the right side, you will likely see plethoric dilated IVC, and you will likely lose the visualization of the sliding and the B lines. And this is an example of heart failure patient, acute heart failure. You will see cardiomyopathy, whether it's systolic or diastolic heart failure, you will see uh, probably a dilated IVC. And you will also importantly look for signs of heart failure, the extensive number of B lines and pleural effusion. And this is a patient with pulmonary embolism. You can see in these patients dilated right heart due to pressure overload. You will see dilated plethoric IVC and you will see the A-lines and you will look into the deep veins and probably see a DVT. So putting this all together is very important when you reach a diagnosis. And several courses was developed in Europe and one of the important courses has been developed in the UK which is about the utilization of echo and cardiac arrest and lung ultrasound has been important part of this course since the inception of it uh, where we teach the students how to integrate lung ultrasound in the peri-arrest situations where you can immediately diagnose and tackle pneumothorax and other problems in acute situations. So this is the initial part of the talk which is the introductory part of lung ultrasound. So now we can probably start to the second part, which is the case-based discussions. So I have prepared for you four cases, given us different pathologies. Uh, so probably we will start by our first case, if you are ready. Shall we do it? Okay. So the first case is a 75 years old lady with history of hypertension, develops worsening shortness of breath and hypoxia on day one after having an elective right total knee replacement. It's a quite common scenario, I believe. Elderly, right total knee replacement, she starts to be short of breath and distressed, and we are in the, uh, here in the, on the unit, and we want to know what happened to the patient. So we brought our echo, we looked at the heart and the IVC, and this is what we can see from her echo. So it looks like normal biventricular function, is nothing abnormal, and the IVC looks all right, collapsing with the respiration, she's a spontaneously breathing lady, so, what do you think could have happened? What is the reason for hypoxia? Is it the heart? Is it the lung? We brought the lung ultrasound. Although the first thing to do usually in this situation historically has been a chest X-ray. But we thought that X-ray will not be as helpful because it will likely show you some shadows that you will not be able to really know what is the origin and problem behind this shadow. So this is what we have seen in this patient when we put the cardiac probe at the right costophrenic angle first. So the clip on the left shows us the liver. It shows us the diaphragm. And on the si other side of the liver, we saw this very tissue-like structure, which is definitely what is described as consolidation. Okay? You don't see any evidence of pleural effusion. So this is important to tell and know as well. And when we change the probe to the linear vascular probe, we look here and look at the video on the right side. We can look at the pleural line and we see the irregularities of the pleural line and this sub-pleural consolidation here. And if we put this both together with the hypoxia of the lady, we can tell that this lady developed pneumonia and developed uh, hypoxia due to this pneumonia. So now we know what happened. But unfortunately, the lady deteriorated 
and she had to be tubed and ventilated and even she ended up being on VV ECMO, respiratory ECMO. And now we feel like we are stuck, so we had to do a chest X-ray, a conventional strategy to do. X-ray, what do you see on X-ray? Bilateral lung infiltrations. But, again, can you tell anything else? Just bilateral infiltrations. So we want specifically to know what happened on each area of the lung because the lady is worsening. So now we did our systematic examination. We looked at, this is the right, this is uh, uh, the two images, are the two medial images on the right side, the right lung, and the images on the right here are the two lateral images on the left lung. And here we can see the upper zones with B lines and the lower zones with extensive consolidation. And this consolidation is important because it has these very heterogeneous black and hyperechoic white discoloration inside it, which is a typical finding in patients with pneumonia and consolidation. This is the air bronchogram, because you can see the air inside the bronchi, inside the tissue-like densities. And on the left side, quite the same. Even, you can see the air moving in the bronchi with every breath which is what they describe as a dynamic air bronchogram. And again, it is very, very specific for patients with pneumonia. With pneumonia. And now we can tell that this patient has non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema and ARDS. And these B lines, as we said, it happens in both heart failure and patients with pneumonia. But we know from the irregularity of the plural line that they are likely due to non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema and not heart failure. And when we look, we looked again closely with the linear probe, the vascular probe, we saw the irregularity of the pleural line and the subpleural consolidation here. So you have one very clear subpleural consolidation here, and this one is also there, which is less clear. Could you ever tell this with X-ray alone? So lung ultrasound is very useful in this situation. And this is an important thing we just mentioned in the lecture about how to differentiate atelectasis from consolidation which is very important because if you have a telexis patient in the intensive care, you can give some positive pressure ventilation to open up the lung. You can request the bronchoscopy, for example. And this is how you can probably differentiate between both. The atelectatic lung will probably be homogeneous in structure like this. It will not be very heterogeneous like the consolidation here. So this is the consolidation with air bronchogram and likely this is an, a degree of atelectasis or compressive atelectasis due to the large pleural effusion around it. Let's move to case two. So case two is a bit different. 76 years old lady who had a metallic mitral valve replacement 10, years, 10 days ago, but despite having the surgery, she is still short of breath and she's requiring increasing amounts of oxygen. And, but this time we did the traditional thing in the beginning, X-ray. Call the X-ray, X-ray was done. What can you see on the x-ray? Bilateral basal opacities, right? Can you tell, is there any specific finding in the x-ray? No. So what would you like to do? Lung ultrasound. So let's do lung ultrasound. So this is what you can see on the patient's lung ultrasound. This is a bilateral large pleural effusion with compressive atelectasis and what they describe as the jellyfish side. And without lung ultrasound, you will not be able to do this unless you send the patient to CT with high degree of radiation exposure, the cost of CT, the risk of transferring patient to the CT scanner, especially if they are critically ill. So now you know there is a pleural effusion. You can consider draining this effusion. You can give diuretics if your patient is known to have heart failure, if you find any abnormality on echo. But now you can tell why the patient has worsening oxygenation. But it is not that simple. So I brought you different other examples of atelectasis and consolidation together. So we mentioned that atelectasis is more likely to be homogeneous, and consolidation is usually heterogeneous. And the ecogenicity is a bit uh, not uh, simple as patients with atelectasis. But you can actually find both together, because you can find an atelectatic lung with some consolidation on top. So this, even you can tell with lung ultrasound. As you can see, this is a patient with large pleural effusion, but the base of this density here is very heterogeneous, and you can find some 
air programs, but the remaining part is more homogeneous. So it's very specific. It can tell you what degree of atelectasis is there and what degree of consolidation is there. And the same stands for this patient as well. Compressed atelectatic lung with some consolidation here and large pleural effusion. And it can even tell you if this effusion is simple or complex. <coughs> Because pleural effusion can be complex. It can be chronic, it can be septated with a lot of adhesions, and without knowing the simplicity or complexity of it, you may harm your patient by sticking a chest drain in a patient with complex pneumothorax with probable lung injury. So this is a finding that you can see with a complex effusion, as you can see here, with a degree of atelectasis. Next case, a 68 years old gentleman who is non-hypertensive, diabetic, dyslipidemic, and uh, diagnosed as abdominal aortic aneurysm. And he went for aortic endovascular surgery. And while into the operation, he developed sudden hypoxia and hypotension. So what could be the reason? The anesthetist was very, very um, weird. Uh, he was very surprised. What is the cause of hypoxia and hypertension? He tried to give the patient vasopressors. He tried to give the patient more PEEP, more post-pressure ventilation. But the problem is, he's getting more hypoxic, he's getting more hypotensive. He did an ECG. The patient was in rapid atrial fibrillation. So rapid atrial fibrillation, okay. But again, why the patient is hypoxic? Why the patient is hypotensive? So we did the preferred thing, lung ultrasound. Easy, on the table. You don't need to move the patient. You put your probe right side and left side. What can you see here? On the right lung, we lost the sliding of the pleura. If you compare the pleural line here to the pleural line on the left, here you see the sliding and you see B lines, but here you don't see sliding at all. And at the base of the lung, you also lost the sliding as compared to the sliding here. So this patient has a pneumothorax. And that's why with more pressure, you're causing tension pneumothorax and causing hypotension. And you're worsening the patient instead of helping him. And we confirm it by putting a moat, by seeing the typical barcode or stratosphere sign on the right lung. But the left lung was normal, sliding, and normal seashore sign, where you see clearly the heterogeneity of this beautiful sand or sand-like structure. And obviously, he developed a pneumothorax from the central line, which was inserted without ultrasound guidance. So now we know the diagnosis with the lung ultrasound. Last case? You ready for the last case? OK. So 2 o'clock in the morning, not uncommon scenario. We are in the CCU, and we are facing this patient. The nurse is calling you, doctor, please come and help. 68 years old, male, ischemic cardiomyopathy, with low ejection fraction, severe mitral regurg, and history of COPD. And he's having worsening hypoxemia and shock. So what's happening for this patient? You need to do something quickly, because your patient is deteriorating. Unfortunately, we did the standard thing, x-ray. We waited for the x-ray man, he came and did an x-ray, and we found these bilateral opacities. Can you tell anything from the x-ray? Can you take a decision based on the x-ray alone? Okay, so we wanted more specific details, and that's why we decided to do lung ultrasound. We know this patient has a background of ischemic cardiomyopathy, so we saw healthy thin pleural line. Look at this. It's very different from the pleural line in patients with pneumonia and ARDS. Very healthy pleural line, extensive number of B lines, and even our patient has this. He had a curtain-like the B lines are too many, so they are fused together, and they made a curtain-like structure, or what they call a confluent B lines. This reflects an alveolar edema. So our patient was in pulmonary edema, and we immediately decided to give him diuretics. We probably give him inotropes. We give him any, anything to provide uh, a, a help in the afterload if the blood pressure allows. And you see the progression after you give the diuretics. Your patient improved, and the number of B lines reduced. And this can tell you immediately that you are doing the right thing. And at the base, we saw large pleural effusion as well. So you can help by probably draining the effusion if you need. So the final take-home message, lung ultrasound is 
a new frontier in acute cardiac care. It should be an integral part of our echocardiographic study, as we recommend. B lines can be used reliably for monitoring patients uh, with heart failure, for diagnosis, for monitoring the treatment progress, and for prognostication. Integrated approach is always crucial. Use all the tools that you have and know. And finally, be very important to learn it well because accreditation and quality control is very important to make sure that you are doing the right thing for your patient. And remember that B lines are everywhere. Thank you very much.